Let's take a look at players in the NBA who are trending up, trending down, a buy low, sell high, if you will, if you're allowed to do trades. But if not, it's still a lot of stuff to talk about, Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I think I swallowed a harmonica. I'm also the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball, on TikTok at RedRock underscore B-Ball, and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free. We're available on all platforms. Why don't you bang it out? Audio, download, video, watch, thumbs up, bell rung, comments written. Wow, what a day. That is great to help the show the operation. Let's do 75K for the end of the year to get the subscribers up over on YouTube. But just drop your comments down below. Are you in the playoffs? Are you going to be in the playoffs? How's your matchup going? How many injuries did you cop yesterday? Probably a lot. I'm guessing. I hope not. Tell me all that stuff. Now, I know. I know the trade deadline is over. I, I know that for most people. Dynasty leagues, it's not. And if your dynasty league has a trade deadline... Probably shouldn't. Oh, that's not true, actually. That's debatable. Scrap that. You can have trade deadlines in Dynasty Leagues. You shouldn't have um, cutting off of waiver ads. So teams that get eliminated from playoffs, they absolutely should be able to make moves in the um, in the fantasy playoffs for Dynasty Leagues, I believe. But that's a separate point. Some leagues will still have trade deadlines, but as I've said time and time and time again, buy lows, sell highs. The more you play fantasy basketball, the more you uh, get into leagues with people who have been playing for a longer time, the amount of trades go down. I did one trade all season. I traded away Aaron Neesmith for D'Angelo Russell. That's the only trade I made. Someone offered it to me. I accepted it. That's it. There's a lot of trades that go down that honestly just shouldn't. You shouldn't make them. We talk about buy lows and sell highs. People love to talk about that. But what it also is, look, it's very hard to pull off buy lows. It's even harder to pull off sell highs. But what this is a good thing to look at, I think, in the way I look at it, is looking at players who are performing really well or really poorly because we all have this immediacy bias. We go, oh my God, this guy sucks. So I like to, oh, this guy, man, he's dominating. I'm unstoppable. I'll never lose. Right, so what we look at here is the guys who are buy lows or the guys who are sell highs, understanding what's happening and how real it is and how unreal it isn't, and where do you go from here or what can you expect as you move forward. So it's a trend watch, really. This guy's up here. He's falling down. This guy's um, you know, sniffing feet down the bottom. He's going to jump back up. That's the general point of all of this. So buy low, sell high in name, sure. But let's just take a look at guys who are... Above expectations or below expectations? Let's have a look at how we did on this two weeks ago. Do you, what do you reckon? What, what do you reckon our odds are? 10 out of 10, 8 out of 10, 6 out of 10, 4 out of 10? Drop that in the chat or in the comments as well. How do you think we went in terms of predicting who was going up and who was going down? Well, I can tell you on the buy low side of things, we uh, we got there. We got the full 5 out of 5. Barely for some of them, but we got there. Jalen Brown was 116th. He's 27th since then. W. Darius Garland was 113th. He's 49th since then. He can be better. He got a week at least now with no Mitchell as well. Shingun was 106th. He's 89th since then. That can still get better as well. Tyrese Halliburton. This one just snuck in. 87th. He's 79th since then. He's been bad. There's no questioning that. He has still got, and I could have had him as a buy low option on today's show as well. I didn't because I don't want to double it up, but he can obviously get better than that. And Devin Booker was 56th. He's up to 16th. And now, of course, he's hurt. So that's not ideal, but he's still improved significantly since we did this show, the week 17 um, buy low, sell high show. What about the other side? That's five out of five. What do we hit here? One out of five, five out of five. Do we go the perfect 10 out of 10? Well, the answer is yes, we do. W, Chet, and barely, Chet Holmgren was 14th, and I said I don't think he's going to maintain that number. He's 17th since then, barely. These other ones, though, we smashed them out of the park. Dan Gafford was 24th. This was after he arrived in Dallas as well. After, he's 236th since then. I'm just going to chuck one of these on it. Get that garbage out of here! I actually got a question today. I haven't answered it yet on Twitter. Someone said, hey, should I add Dan Gafford for this week in case he gets more minutes? No, you shouldn't, like... 
I guess maybe he gets more minutes, but like, what's the that's that's wish casting, right? No way. Two hundred thirty sixth. He's been over the last two weeks. Jeremy Grant was forty second. He's one hundred seventeenth since then. These are per game. This doesn't account for his injury or missing the last game. Uh, the big sneeze, Precious Achua was fifty third. He's one hundred eighteenth since then. And Denny Avdia is was sixty sixth. And we talked at at length about his presence in mainstream basketball media. And the way that people were talking about how he was the second coming. And he's 120th since then because the stuff he was doing was unrealistic. The absolute poster child for the way that you assess fantasy basketball and trends and trades. That was the best example I reckon you will ever get for that sort of a scenario. So who are our 10 this week? Who are the magical men who are going to go up or go down? We hope. Let's see. By lows. KD. Durant is 63rd in minus one rankings the last two weeks, 115th on Yahoo, averaging 42 fantasy points. 24.5 points, seven rebounds, four and a half assists. That looks all right. That's okay, yeah? He's shooting 44 from the field, though, 26 from three, and 76 from the line. That's not Kevin Durant. 26.5% from three. He's at 42% for the season. Now, earlier this year, he was rolling at like 55, 45, 95, or some insane number. It was always going to come down, and it's hit really hard. Because now he also can't hit free throws. 75.6% from the line. Over the last two weeks, he's at 85.6% for the season. You'll notice that on these shows, on the video side, I normally put it like, who do you target in trades? I'm not going to do that because we're not doing trades. But Durant, he's obviously better than the 63rd ranked player. Um, He's obviously a better shooter than all of that stuff. I think Durant is very comfortably can go back to being a top 10 per game player from here. It shouldn't be difficult. It's just big, big jumps that are going to come in 10 percentage points in free throws, probably you know, 15 percentage points in three point percentage. And even his twos um, can jump up five or six percentage points. It's so easy to see how all of this happens for Durant to get back to where he needs to be. That is almost without argument, something that is going to improve. He's in a slump and it just won't stay that bad. It just won't. Same with old mate Steph Curry. Now, these former teammates are obviously getting on in age, and as players get older, they get worse. This is this is what happens. Durant hasn't really been that much worse this season. Steph has been. I wouldn't say it's been terrible, but he's been worse overall. He is barely a top 20 player for the season. He's actually 19th for the year. But at the moment, we're in a real slump. He's 53rd in minus one, 66th on Yahoo, 75th in points leagues over the last two weeks, averaging 21 points, four rebounds, 4.7 assists, He's still hitting 4.1 threes but with 0.9 steals and 1.1 blocks. Oh, sorry, uh, 0.1 blocks. So the fact that he is still hitting 4.1 threes but hitting them at only 31% is a frightening number. That means he is taking an absolute truckload, 13.1 three-point attempts per game. And he's just not hitting them, 31.5%. His field goals are at 36.7. Yuck. His free throws, they're fine, 933 so he's at 31.5% from three. Do I even need to tell you that Steph Curry is at 407 for the season from three? Like looking at that, you know that he's going to improve it at least 10 percentage points. He might even get up to 15 percentage points on his three, which of course bumps his scoring up, bumps his field goals up, bumps his three-pointers made up. If he's hitting the, his threes at this number, at these attempts, you're talking 5.2 a game, like a crazy number. He's also can't hit twos anymore. Now his two-point numbers are down for the year. He was at 58 last season, 53 the year before that, 57 the year before that. This is a very common thing in people when they get older. Harder to finish, less explosion. Explosion? That's not how you say that word. Explosion. Um, he just It just happens. Your legs go as you get older. But 47 is very low. He's at 51.9 for the season. So you're talking four or five extra percentage points there at least. You could suggest that there's 10 percentage points room from what he did last season because it would be true. So there's lots to jump up. And of course, all that jumps up. His field goals, which sit at a ridiculous 37. His three-pointers made. He's scoring. All of this jumps back up very easily. I don't have Steph as being a top 10 player, first round player rest of season. I've got him top 20. And I think that's reasonable to expect that he can go back to that number yeah, you know, without too much happening. Today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. That's what brings home the winning trophy. It is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything that you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance like 
we used to get from Steph. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what it is you're looking for at eBay. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber and not cash. So with all the parts that you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit is only available to US customers. Let's do, as that subscribe button comes up and it wasn't supposed to, that's okay. You can hit subscribe again. Who's the next buy low guy? Well, we're talking about another older player who's been a stud for fantasy for many years, and that is the Beatle himself, Paul George. Um, George has dealt with some knee soreness. He's dealt with some groin issues. But he's also 115th over the last two weeks. That's not real, right? He's not that bad. 117th on Yahoo, 89th in points leagues, averaging under 20 points a game, 18.8 with 5.4 rebounds, 2.8 assists. He's still hitting three and a half threes, 0.8 steals and 0.2 blocks. So what's going on? Well, there's a few things. He's hitting under 45% from the field. He's still hitting 43% from three, but 40, 56 from the line? And while I do use minus one rankings, which takes away the worst category, so it would eliminate those free throws from his overall rank number, free throw percentage still has an impact on your scoring. So when he's not hitting them at anywhere near the rate that he normally does, like for an example, uh, Paul George at the moment, well, for the season, he hits 3.3 free throws a game. Over the last five games, he's at 1.8. So there's one and a half extra points. There you go. That pushes him over the 20 point per game marker. That's, that's easy. It's already done. So there's that part of it. Yes, his usage is a little bit down from 26.7 to 23.8 over the last five games. I think it can hover around the 25 mark. That's fine. But at the moment, it's down. So you know, we, we see some easy areas of improvement, the free throws. But the next one, steals. Half. He's half the steal rate. 1.6 steals per game this season. He's at 0.8. Now, we know the story about steals. We know the volatility. You have a zero steal game and a zero steal game and then a one steal game. Versus a one steal game, one steal game, one steal game. It's two plays different over three games, and it's a gigantic difference. It's 0.3 steals versus one steal. Turns you into a terrible steals guy to a good steals guy from two plays. That's the frustrating part with low volume categories, and it's why if you heavily rely upon them, you need to be so, so good in those categories to guarantee you will win each week. And that's why you'll find in head to head category leagues, mo- a lot of weeks you'll go and you go, oh, yeah, I think I've got these locked up, but it's going to come down to steals. How often does that happen? Like all the time. You, when you go back and figure, yeah, it is. Steals is the thing, yeah? It's all, it's nearly always down to steals because of the variability of them, because of the low-volume nature of them, because the value of them is spread through so many different types of players. It's not guard-heavy necessarily. It's not big-heavy necessarily. But regardless, Paul George has been a good steals guy for years and years and years. I don't think 0.8's real. Like, even get back to 1.2, 1.3. That will pretty comfortably bump you um, back into that discussion of, of, of realistically, where he where he needs to be. Because... He's not there at the moment. So there you go. Paul George is one of your buy lows. What about in Orlando? Uh What about Franz Wagner? The big fella is 102nd over the last two weeks. He's 150th on Yahoo. He's averaging 30 fantasy points only. 91st, and as I've written, 91th. Cool. Um, In fantasy points, he's averaging 15.8 real life points with five and a half boards and four assists, hitting half a three a game. There you go, red flag already. 0.7 steals and 0.8 blocks. These are bad numbers. These are bad low volumes. These are bad peripherals for old mate Franz Wagner. Now, Franz for the season is averaging one steal, 0.4 blocks, and 1.5 threes. They're not world-beating numbers, but they're obviously well down from where they are at the moment. He's hitting 53% from the field, so that doesn't sound bad. Like, that's pretty good, actually. He's at 49, 48% overall for the year. He's hitting 16% of his threes. 16 his twos are, are up for sure. 66% from two when he's at 56 for the season. So that's going to come down, but he's not going to hit 15.8% from three. He's only at 30.7% from three for the season. Last season, he was at 36% from three. The season before, guess what he was at? 36% from three. So he's been very much down from three all season, but there's hope that he gets back to 35 or at least for the final five and a half weeks of the season has a run of, he's not going to get his overall season number up to 35, but like I say all the time, when someone has a big game and you add them, you don't get the past game. If someone has a poor run and you add them or trade for them, whatever, like you don't 
you don't get those bad games. Or if you drop someone after a bad game, you don't get to erase that off your team's ledger. So even if France doesn't get back to 36% three-point shooting for the entirety of the season, there's a decent chance he's a 36% shooter over the last five and a half weeks or 34% shooter, at least up from 16. Also, what's going on with his free throws? His first three seasons in the league, 86 as a rookie, 84 last season, 85 this season. Last six games, 76. Being that bad from three, that bad from from the line means that that scoring goes from 20 points down to 15.8. He's way better than this. He's a top 50 guy, I think, or close enough to it rest of season. And I expect some big, big improvements for things that just aren't going to hold as poorly as they currently sit. And lastly, if you think I hate the bloke, well, here you go. Nick Vucevic. I actually think he's underperforming. Now, I think I nailed the Vucevic projection this season. I talked about how last season he, out of nowhere, got his percentages through the roof when he was not that guy ever. And I thought that's not going to happen again. He's going to be the third offensive option once more. And I think that, you know, when people saw his Yahoo totals from the season before when he was eighth, people were overrating him significantly. And by the end of draft season, he actually had moved down to where I thought it was fine, like at 55, 56, which is about where I had him. And he's literally been bang on there, even with the boost of having no Zach Levine for all season because his percentages have been pretty poor most of the year. But even I realize or recognize that what he's doing at the moment is um, yeah, going to be better. He's 75th over the last two weeks, 78th on Yahoo. He's averaging 40 fantasy points. But again, you look at it, you go 20 and 12. That's really good, yeah, Josh. It is for those two categories, sure. 2.8 assists. He's hitting 1.3 threes with 0.7 steals and 0.7 blocks. But again, you look at it, 47 from the field, which honestly... That's not that bad. He, this, is his, this is why I didn't love what he did last season to carry over. His last three seasons, 48, 47, 52. And guess where he's at this year? Yeah, 47. So he's at 47 from the field. He's shooting 28% from three. 28. Last season, he shot 35. And he's at 57 from the line. Now that is ridiculous because he is an 84% shooter this season. Although weirdly, over his last 25 games, he's down to 77%. And two years ago, he was at 76% from the line. So maybe he's not an 83% guy. Maybe he is a 79% guy. But he's still better than 57. So that's got unbelievable room to jump up. He doesn't get to the line a huge amount, but that obviously hurts. He never gets to the line. 1.2 attempts over the last six games. Horrible. And the threes. I don't think that he's a 27% guy. Although, he's shooting 27.5% from three literally all season. So... I've put his number last year, 34.9 there, because again, like I just said, with Paul George, or with Franz Wagner, sorry, is that it doesn't necessarily matter that he's been 27 all season. He's not going to get back to being a 34 guy that he was last season, or maybe even a 32 guy for the extent of the rest of the year. But for five and a half weeks, can he turn into a 32% shooter and recover that category, boost your scoring, boost your field goals, boost your three-pointers made? It's not outrageous. I don't, I'm not going to say he's a good shooter, but 31, 32 for five weeks, I think it's possible. So a guy who's been very down on virtual season, I actually think he's fairly close to washed as a player, to be honest. Terrible contract they gave him. He's not washed, but he's not, he's not a top 10 center in the NBA. He's not a top 15 center in the NBA. And that's an idea. Maybe in the offseason, I do my rankings, not even fantasy related, like top point guards, top shooting guards. Would you guys be interested in that? Or you'd be like, Josh, I don't care. Fantasy's over. We're not, we're not watching. Just shut up. Shut up. Maybe we'll do that. We'll find out. Give me some ideas. Um, but yeah, there are very obvious, significant areas of improvement that can come there from Nikola Vucevic. Today's episode is also brought to you by Better Help. Better Help. Sometimes you all, we all need that opportunity to get something off our chest, whether it's big or small, certain things can really start to get to you. Maybe you're a Chicago Bulls fan and you are constantly watching this team and going, this is not fun. Why did we re-sign Vooch to that contract? Why did we refuse to move Zach Levine? Why did we not give up Alex Caruso for two first round picks and Moses Moody? Why do we let DeMar DeRozan's contract expire and then either overpay him or, not, or lose him for nothing? Yeah, get that off your chest. And doing that to someone who's unbiased in your life can be really helpful, not just for that situation, which honestly doesn't mean anything in the end, but it can impact your overall well-being and mental health, but it also teaches you some skills to cope with other things in your life. Therapy can be different for everyone, and most of us have bigger problems than our favorite sports teams being the Chicago Bulls. 
So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. If it's, it's entirely online. It's designed to be flexible. It's designed to be suited to your schedule as well. So visit betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA to get 10% off your first month. That is betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash locked on NBA. So let's go through now the five sell highs. Who are the guys who are flying? And again, if you want to say that I am biased, people people love saying that. Josh, you're so biased against guys or biased for guys. All that is, is that I, I think that someone is better than general consensus or I think someone is worse than general consensus. But how, how can you not be like biased or have opinions on players? And I have had bias or opinions on this guy forever. And it is maximum Derek White, who's the 12th ranked player over the last two weeks. And he's been one of my more, I won't say favorite players, because I'm not sitting there with posters on my wall of players. But I've been someone who's gone, man, he's good. Why is no one thinking he's good? That's how I've always viewed him, right? And now he's flying. 12th over the last two weeks. 11th on Yahoo. 38th in fantasy points. How is this happening? Because the man's averaging under 15 points a game. So 14.8 with 4.4 rebounds and 6.6 assists. Well, it comes in the small ones, doesn't it? Three steals, three, not three steals, three threes a game, 1.6 deals and 1.6 blocks. They are insane. You'll say, Josh, he's been doing this all season. Well, no, not really. He's been averaging 1.1 steals per game. He's been averaging 1.2 blocks per game. Admittedly, ridiculously good. But 1.6 to 1.2 in terms of blocks, that's a 33% increase. It's a bit more than 33% increase on your steal numbers. All that stuff matters. He's hitting 54% from three over the last two weeks. He's at 41 for the year. He was at 38 last season, 31 the year before that, 35 the year before that. Hard for me to rely upon him, not only as a 40% guy, maybe he is a 40% guy, but he's not a 54% guy because literally nobody is. He's also hitting every two in the world, 69% from two. He was at 55 last season, he's at 55 this season. So there's going to be a crash here. The blocks won't stay at 1.6. The steals won't stay at 1.6. The threes won't stay at three a game. The shooting won't stay at 59% overall because of his threes and his twos. And he hasn't missed a free throw either. I love Derek White, but none of this is realistic to continue. None of it is. You can't keep these numbers up. It's impossible to do it. He's going to fall off. And you just hope that it doesn't fall off to a stage where he becomes the 120th ranked player for a week or two. Let's go to 3 a.m. morning grind legend, big face himself, emo Jimmy Butler, who is uh, who has been bad all season. Let's be fair; like he has not been a good fantasy option for us all year. He killed my 30 deep team. I picked him at like 25 in the first round, and that's it. I'm out of the playoffs. First time I've ever never made the playoffs in 30 deep. I had a really bad season, and because I'm an idiot, and I drafted Jim Butler. He's 13th though over the last two weeks. It's only 52nd on Yahoo because of limited games because of a suspension. He's eighth in fantasy points, averaging 50 a game. And I know a lot of you will say, well, Jimmy doesn't care at the start of the season. And then he ramps it up the second half of the year. And I'll, I beg you to look at his past performances. That's just not true. He has generally been worse over his career in February and March. Yes, in the playoffs, he generally performs better. But again, the narrative around that often gets overblown as well. But as a general rule, Butler has never been this guy that... The thing with him was... A, a, Persistent thing was like, man, you've got to move off of Jimmy before the All-Star break because he just breaks down and doesn't play through February, March. Now, maybe he's changed that by breaking down earlier in the season. That's possible too. But there's stuff that he's doing here, regardless of Jimmy saving himself, that's just not real. Like 25.8 points, 5.8 rebounds, 6.3 assists. He's hitting one and a half threes with 2.3 steals and a block per game. Jimmy's averaging 0.4 blocks for the season. He averaged 0.3 last season, 0.5 the year before, 0.3 the year before that. I'm not going to sit here and believe that he's a one block per game player. I'm also not going to sit here and believe he's a 60% three-point shooter. For the year, Jimmy's hitting 46% from three. Yeah, it's on really low volume, 2.3 attempts per game. But again, that's not real either. He hit only 35% last season, and that was a step up. The year before that, 23 and 25. Now, he has worked on his three, and he is hitting more threes than ever before, and he's better at it. He's not that better. There can be a real big slump coming. And while we always look at Jimmy as a good steals guy, because he is, 2.3 is extremely high. He's at 1.4 this season. He was at 1.8 last season. He was at 1.6 the year before that. And 1.8 is still great. It's not 2.3. That's 2.3 versus 1.8. That's two extra steals per week. That's just not a realistic thing to expect him to go at this level 
with that level of shooting, with that level of scoring, and even that level of assists. It helps that Hero is out bumping his usage. He's up to 28 usage over the last four games. And when Hero and Rogier, well, Rogier's already back, but when they're back, he's just not going to do these things. And then the steal could drop and the threes will probably drop as well. So Butler is going to suffer a drop-off. This is not, oh, look at Jimmy Butler, the mythical nature of the beast who just turns it on at this point of the year. That's why he's rolling. That's not 100% true because this stuff can't hold. It just can't, irrespective of the, the mythos of what Jim provides. Let's go to Denver. Michael Ponder Jr., he, I have had many questions about Porter this season about, hey, do I need to drop Michael Porter Jr.? And he has been anecdotally one of the more inconsistent guys this season. I don't have any of the numbers in front of me because I don't have that readily available, but I will get it and we will look at that through the off season. But this guy is absolutely flying. 15th over the last two weeks, ninth on Yahoo. 40 fantasy points, 34th. He's averaging 22 points a game, nine rebounds, two assists, hitting 3.23s with 0.8 steals and 0.8 blocks. You go, okay, what actually looks crazy there? What is it? He's hitting 57 from the field, 43 from three, hasn't missed a free throw. All right, cool. He can be a really good shooter. We know this. Can he shoot 43 from three? Like, why not? He's at 40 for the season. He was at 41 last season. He was at 45 two years ago, three years ago. He can be a 40% guy. That's not that outrageous. What is very much different is he's averaging 9.3 boards. He's at 7.2 for the season. Last season, 5.5. The year before that, 6.6. The year before that, 7.3. Big, big rebounding boost at the moment for Porter. And he also can't miss twos. He also can't miss free throws. He hasn't missed a free throw in a month. He's not taking many of them, but he hasn't missed one in a month. He was at 80% from the line last season, 82 this season, 100% of his last 10 games. Um, But he's twos, 69% from two. He's at 57 for the year, 57 last season. These are big rebound numbers, big two-point numbers, His minutes are actually up to 33 a game. His usage is slightly higher as well. He's on a hot streak, but we know that he will cool off at some point, and I would imagine coming pretty soon. This one's obvious, I believe, and it is Josh the Hitman Hart. I don't know when Ananobi's coming back. I don't know how long Brunson's out. I don't know when Randall's coming back. I don't know if Randall's coming back. I don't know when Robinson's coming back. I don't know any of those things. But irrespective of that, what Hart is doing at the moment is just not likely to hold. He's 34th in minus one rankings. He's 15th in Yahoo points rankings, averaging 45 fantasy points. He's 31st on Yahoo's player radar over the last two weeks. He's averaging 16.5 points with 12.5 rebounds and 6.2 assists, 2.3 triples, 1.3 steals, 0.7 blocks. He's only hitting 43% from the field. He's at 41% from three and 59 from the line. So he's a better free throw guy than that, obviously. His two-point percentage is down at 44%. Not that he's a good two-point guy, but he has been 60% two years in a row prior to this year. So there's all reasons why that can improve. But this man does not hit threes like this. He's going at 41% from three. He's at 32 for the season. This is a hot streak from three tied in with the fact that he's playing 43 minutes a night. And at some point, he won't. He was playing 27 minutes a night when the team was healthy. He's getting 16 extra minutes a game. And yeah, I don't know when those guys come back. So he's going to get extended run, but it's going to fall away hard. And it doesn't even need one of them to come back, to be honest, because he won't continue to go up 41%. He probably won't average 12 rebounds per game, I'm guessing. His rebounds per 36 are 10.4 over the last six games. Weird, his rebounds per 36 are lower than his actual rebounds per game. Um, But for the season, he's at 8.8 rebounds per 36. So... Yes, obviously, Randall not being there does impact that. But all this stuff's going to come back down. He's also almost at 18% usage when he's been a 13% usage guy all season. So this might continue for a little bit of time. But even if it does in these big minutes, it's just unlikely that he shoots at this level and he hits two and a half threes a game. He's not going to last as a top 35 player. And if players return, he won't be a rosterable 12 10 league guy because he hasn't been. Last one is Keegan Murray who, like Michael Ponder, has had wild inconsistencies this season. He is the 95th ranked player overall for the year. People might tell you, Kings fans will tell you, the big steps forward he's taken defensively. And that is true, he's taken some steps forward. But offensively, overall, he hasn't, he hasn't improved hugely. He's playing three and a half extra minutes this year versus his rookie year. But at the moment, he's on a huge hot streak. 41st in minus one, 15th on Yahoo!, 31 fantasy points, averaging 17, 5 with 1.2 assists. 
He's hitting 2.73s with 1.3 steals and a block. There's already something that's a little bit abnormal there. 52 from the field, 49 from three, and 100 from the line. So every one of those percentages is too high. He's at 66 true shooting over the last six games. And he did that while in that time where Darren Fox was out. He's at 57.8 true shooting for the season. So the field goal percentage at 52, he's at 46.6 for the year. The three-pointers at 48.5, well, he's at 36 for the year. The free throws at 100, well, he's at 82 for the year. There are huge efficiency numbers going to drop, which impacts his three-pointers made, impacts his scoring, and impacts his percentages, obviously. He's also playing 37 minutes a night, and we know that if you get into a cold streak under Mike Brown, then the minutes fall back away. I'm not saying he's not going to hit 32 or anything, 33 like that, but 37 a night doesn't seem like it's likely to hold. And in fact, his last two games have actually been down as well. He shot 47 and 38 the last two games. He had 11 points in the last one and floated it with three blocks. So while he's rolling at the moment, and that Yahoo 15th is obviously an insane number. He's not the 15th best player. He hasn't been the 15th best player at all. That is why I highly, highly recommend you to ignore Yahoo rankings. They do not give you any sort of accurate representation of where a player sits. But Murray's not this guy. 100th best player, perhaps. Perhaps. Not this level. Not even close. And that brings me to the end of the buy low, sell high show, which of course, you know, is not really a buy low and sell high show. It's just talking about guys who are up and are down and are going to crash or are going to fly. So hit that subscribe button. Hit the thumbs up. Leave your comments down below. Tell me what you thought of the guys there. What do you disagree with? How bad are my biases? Drop them in the comments down below, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. See ya.